Okay, another question. So who, who, can, who can you lawfully marry? Um, and I, and I, I've spoken to, to about this topic with a, with a couple of you. But I just think this is an interesting topic. Who can you uh, lawfully marry? Because people will say, well, is it a sin to marry a relative? Well, if you think about that, all of us go back to Adam and Eve and all of us go back to Noah. So if, if, you, didn't, if you don't marry a relative, you didn't marry a human being. Everybody has to marry a relative because we're all related. But generally people will talk about, well, is it a sin to marry a close relative? Is it a sin to marry, for example, a brother or a sister? Now, I may shock you, but I believe for consistency in doctrine, I personally believe it is not a sin to, it's not a sin in and of itself to marry a brother or a sister. And why, why do I believe that? Because you might think I'm crazy for believing that. But the reason why I don't think it would have, been a, a, would have always been a sin is because if it was a sin, then it would have always been a sin. You know, because if something is morally wrong, then it's always morally wrong. But then we know that in Genesis, when Adam and Eve brought forth Cain, Abel, and Seth and had sons and daughters, somebody along the line had to marry their sister. I mean, it's just a fact, right? I mean, somebody would have had to marry their sister somewhere along the line, either Cain, Abel, or Seth. And if they didn't marry their sister, they would have married their niece or their nephew. So somebody either would have, have, have had to have married their sister or have had to have married their, either their aunt or their uncle or their niece or their nephew. So if it was a sin, a moral sin in and of itself, I just don't believe God would put man in a situation where he had no choice but to sin. Because remember, God is saying, be fruitful and multiply, you know, and to, and to marry one another. So if they had to marry, they would have had to marry uh, a brother or a sister. And you know what? It's, it's the only sin that, I, that people, or it's the only issue that I know of where people think, well, it was wrong at the time of Moses and it's wrong after Moses, but it was okay before Moses. Because with everything else, like for example, murder, you know, Mo Moses gave laws about murder, but murder is wrong after Moses, isn't it? But murder was also wrong before Moses. I mean, it was wrong to murder before Moses gave the law, thou shalt not murder, and it was wrong to murder after. So we know that it was always wrong. But then there are laws that were temporary. For example, the food laws. It was wrong to eat pork. It was unclean. But we know that that was always temporary because before Moses, they could eat any animal. And after Moses, we can eat any animal. So we know that it was not morally sinful in and of itself because we are allowed to eat pork now. It was just imposed on the nation of Israel for a temporary time. But why, when it comes to marrying close relations, this is neither something that is always wrong because how could it have been a sin in the beginning when God created only one man and one woman? But it's wrong after the law of Moses. You see what I'm saying? Like it's the only thing that was... Because either it's wrong and then it was wrong at the time of Moses and then it's wrong after the time of Moses. Or it was right, it was okay before the time of Moses, wrong at the time of Moses and then right in the new covenant. But this whole issue of marrying your sister or marrying a close, close relative, it's only right before Moses, wrong at Moses, and then wrong after Moses. It's, the, it's like the only scenario that fits in this category. And I, I, there's no, I, I don't see, see there's any way to actually justify it. And I just think it's interesting because if we go to the laws in Leviticus that address this topic, I'll just show you here. Leviticus 20. Verse 17. Leviticus 18 talks about, you know, don't uncover in your near of kin its uncleanness, but does not actually prescribe any uh, judicial punishment. But when we read here in Leviticus 20, this is where punishments are actually given to uh, different types of, um, you know, prohibited relationships. It says here in verse 10, And the man that committed adultery with another man's wife even he that committed adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. 
And I just, want to sh I just want to point to your attention as we go through these different passages that all the scenarios that are given the death sentence can also fall into the category of adultery, which is the death sentence, sleeping with another man's wife. So we saw there in verse 10, adultery, sleeping with another man's wife, a man that lies with his father's wife. So there's adultery again. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Now blood shall be upon them. So there you go. There's a man lying with his son's wife. Adultery again. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. Thou shalt surely be put to death. Thou, their blood shall be upon them. So homosexuality as well, I do believe, should be executed with the death sentence. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them... Oh, I've already read that one. And if, if a man shall take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire, both he and they, that there be no wickedness among you. So obviously, if you're taking a mother as well, the mother is married. So you could also fit that into adultery in some sense. And then if a man lie with beasts, he shall surely be put to death. Um, if a man approach unto any beast, so if a woman sleeps with an animal, she's put to death. But look at this. This is when it gets to a sister. And if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter or his mother's daughter and see her nakedness and she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He hath uncovered his sister's nakedness. He shall bear his iniquity. Now, I just think it's interesting that when it gets to a brother taking his wife, taking his sister as a wife, it no longer ascribes the death penalty. You know, it just says that it's unclean and it's a, it's a wicked thing. And again, when you see here later on, we'll just go down here. Uh, verse 20, if a man shall lie with his uncle's wife, he hath uncovered his uncle's nakedness, they shall bear their sin. They shall die childless. So if you marry your um, aunt who is married to your uncle, that seems to be adultery. But look at verse 21. And if a man, oh, if a man shall take his brother's wife in an unclean, okay, uh, not that one. Oh, where was it? With his uncle's wife, it's with your brother's sister. Oh, here we go. Verse 19, I missed it. And thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, nor of thy father's sister, for he... Un for he uncovereth his near kin, they shall bear their iniquity. So it's just interesting with, you know, when it says, when it talks about marrying your sister or marrying your aunt and your uncle, there's no death sentence prescribed. It's just, it's unclean and they'll bear their iniquity. So what am I saying here? So my point is, you know, it's not a sin in and of itself to marry your sister or marry your aunt and uncle. Otherwise it would have been sinful for Cain, Abel and Seth to marry their sister or marry their niece. But then am I saying then, therefore, marry, is it a good idea to marry your sister or to marry your aunt and your uncle? No, because I think the principle we get here is because it's unclean, now what we know about genetics and about recessive genes, I don't think it's wise for a person to marry somebody that is close of kin because there are issues that can come from that. And we know when there's inbreeding and close breeding, you know, recessive genes come out and there are a lot of problems and diseases that result from it. And this is why I think it is classified as unclean in the law of Moses. Um, because when you marry near of kin, there are problems that result from that. And that's why the Bible says, you know, you will bear your iniquity. You'll, you will bear that uncleanness and it'll be a problem for you. You know, and we can learn a lot of those things from the Old Testament because not necessarily, like it's like food laws. It's not sinful to eat any, anything. I don't even personally think that it's a sin to eat blood. You know, like some cultures actually eat, you know, like in, you know, if you go to Hong Kong, they eat congealed pig's blood and it's literally like cubes of gelatinous blood. And my brother tasted one of them and he said, it's just like blood, like, you know, your nose bleeds and you taste your own blood. It just tastes like, I'm just like, oh, it's so disgusting. But you know, there's, there's a reason why it's unclean. Like it's not necessarily sinful to eat blood, but it's unclean because blood, ha blood has a lot of diseases in it and things like that. And it's the same with pork. You know, it's not sinful to eat pork, but those that, that farm pork and, and farm pigs to, to raise, for, to, to eat, 
they know that they have to give them a special diet. They have to make sure that the pigs are not just eating their own filth and just eating, because pigs will just eat anything you give them. And that's why they're an unclean animal in the Bible, but they're not sinful to eat. But we can take some wisdom from the Bible and say, hey, when we eat pigs, we have to raise them a certain way. We have to make sure that they're clean. Otherwise, we're going to get sick. So it's interesting there that, you know, in Leviticus, that there is that differentiation made there between marrying a brother or marrying an aunt or an uncle or a sister and um, committing adultery and marrying somebody who is already married to somebody else. And I'll just cover a couple of, just a few more things on that topic. But what, what about the age of a woman? You know, how old should a woman be before she gets married? <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 7, verse 36, it says, But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely towards his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. So the Bible doesn't give an age of when a woman can get married. I know in our legal system, they just given an arbitrary age of what? 18, I think, if you're a minor. I think 16 if... If uh, you have parental consent, I, I don't know if that's the law. I think it is. But, you know, that number is arbitrary because, I mean, in the Bible, as long as you have passed the flower of your, of your age, and I guess according to the Bible, I mean, I, I guess according to popular opinion, that would be, you know, when she's, you know, starting her menstrual cycle and she's, she's got a period, that then she is able to get married because the whole idea of marriage is to bring forth children. If you're able to bring forth children, then you're old enough to get married married and you know i personally think you know does that mean oh you know if they say oh but children get their period or women get pe their period at like 13 or 14 are you condoning women getting married at 13 or 14. well i personally think you know there's no way to condemn it if the bible says if she's passed the flower of her age she, sh she is able to get married does that mean a woman should get married at 13. i personally think the way we should approach it is what well, should be just up to the father because remember a father has to decide whether or not to marry his uh, daughter to another man and I think if he thinks that she's ready if he wants to give her away I think that choice is up to him as long as she has passed the flower of her age and that's different for every woman <clears throat> what about a man what a what age can a man marry uh, you know I'm not sure if there's a set age in the Bible but you know the Bible talks about a man leaving his father and mother and cleaving unto his wife so I think there's an element there of responsibility that you're re ready to take on this responsibility of this other man's daughter. So, you know, again, we're not given a certain age. So I don't know whether it's right to say, well, you can't get married until you're 18 or you can't get married until you're 16 and give this arbitrary age because I think it comes down more to the maturity. I think it comes down more to the, the man realizing the responsibility he's taking on and also the father because if the father sees you as irresponsible, he may not want to give his daughter to you and likewise. So I think there's a bit of human judgment involved here. We don't have to set an arbitrary age because, you know, to be honest, if a woman is 15 and she's mature and she's going to marry a mature man that knows his responsibility, I wouldn't condemn that. I, th I just think that's fine. I just think that, there, that there's nothing in the Bible that would condemn it. I, I would leave it up to the opinion of the people involved and leave it up to the fathers. But at the same time, I don't think people should be, you know, condemning other people because they don't fit their man-made ages. Because there's a lot of things in the news now that you read about pedophilia. You know, in the Bible, you never read about pedophilia, right? You never read, you know, you read about bestiality, but why don't you read about pedophilia? Probably because God assumed that parents would love their children enough to not, you know, marry off a six-year-old or a five-year-old that doesn't know what they're doing. But if a father marries off his 14-year-old who, who, has, who has her period already, or a 15-year-old or a 16-year-old, is the person that marries that girl a pedophile? Well, no, because she's past the flower of her age. I mean, I just think this is something that the world has, uh, you know, imposed on, on, um, on people, but the Bible is actually silent on it because the Bible doesn't give an age. And, you know, this, this, this word pedophile just gets thrown around because it's like if, if, a, if a man, maybe in his 20s or 30s, sleeps with a 15-year-old girl, they call him a pedophile. But, I mean, if you see your average 15-year-old girl these days, I mean, she's a woman. I mean, she's developed, she's got a period. Some 15-year-old, I mean, they're, they're not mature in this day and age. 
you know, mentally. But if a woman is, you know, then, then there's nothing wrong with her being married. But, you know, what I'm saying is if a woman is a floozy, you know, she's, she's sleazy and slutty and she's 15, year old, uh, she's 15 years old and she's going to go and sleep with all these men, I don't think that necessarily makes those men pedophiles because she is, she is a woman. She is, she is old enough to, to get married um, and to be a mother that doesn't make them a pedophile. Because, you know, I read these articles, you know, where it says like, oh, you know, this, this woman or this man committed, or this, this man committed pedophilia. And then you read the actual story and it's like a 16 or a 17 year old woman. And you're just like, that's not pedophilia. Because when you think pedophile, you think somebody that's sleeping with a five year old or a four year old. And, you know, it's something that, somebody that's doing something disgusting. Um, not somebody that is of age and uh, can be a, a mother. So all that to just say this, because, you know, I think there's a lot of stigma in our society. I just don't think, and my point is I'm not trying to promote, you know, huge age gaps between married couples. And I'm not trying to promote like an 80 year old marrying a 17 year old. The point I'm just trying to make is I just want us to have a biblical stance because I just want you to realize that in the Bible, these ages are not given. And then when people say, oh, you know, you, you, whatever, you've married somebody that's too young for you or too old for you, or you're married, you know, you're a pedophile because you married an 18 year old because you're 30. You know, I just think this is wrong to insult people or to condemn people for doing something that is not actually wrong in the Bible. Um, you know, because I think the word just gets thrown around. I mean, think about David. I mean, David, when he was old, you know, he would have been like maybe 80 or 90 year, years old. Remember they found a young woman to, to lie with him in bed and to keep, his, keep him warm? You know, was he, was he a pedophile? I mean, I don't think anyone would call David a pedophile, right? Um, so I, I don't think that's the case. And, you know, you know, I personally think, you know, if somebody, you know, I know people personally who were in their 30s and married somebody that was not 20 yet, you know, I wouldn't condemn that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Because we wouldn't have anything wrong with, say, like a 50-year-old marrying somebody in their mid-30s. So why would we have a problem with somebody who's, say, 30, you know, marrying somebody who's, you know, 19? Do you know what I mean? Like, I just don't, I just don't have any way to be able to condemn that from the Bible. But, like I said, I think at the end of the day, I think the decision should be left up to the people, you know, and I think the decision should be left up to the father, whether or not he wants to give his daughter away. And I think that will naturally mean, hey, whatever the father thinks is best um, will be best. Anyway, let's end it there. I won't go on to the other topics because it's a bit long. Um, but let's, uh, let's pray and then we'll start getting dinner, uh, lunch ready.